Okay. Uh, so today uh, we have two special guests, Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack and National Economic Council Director Brian Deese are here to talk to you about what we're seeing behind increases in grocery food prices and what the Biden-Harris administration is doing to lower prices for families. Uh, Brian will discuss the details of the data, namely that beef, pork, and poultry are the real drivers of increased uh, grocery store bills, and that there's an underlying corporate consolidation problem with meat processing giants that we need to address so that families can pay lower prices at the grocery store and farmers and ranchers can earn more. And Secretary Vilsack will discuss the actions our administration is taking to build back a better food system, which includes stepping up antitrust enforcement, investing in small businesses, workers, and a more competitive supply supply chain, our efforts to get ahead of climate-related disruptions, and the need for legislation to make cattle markets more transparent and fair. And they'll take a few questions. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Brian. Great. Thanks, Jen. And uh, it's uh, good to see all of you. Um, I will be um, – I'll, I'll be brief and just provide a little bit of market context and then let uh, Secretary Vilsack really get into the steps we're taking as an administration. But um, as Jen – uh, said the context here is uh, the focus, uh, the ap appropriate focus on the question of grocery prices um, and the increase in grocery prices that we have seen recently over the last uh, couple of months. Um, and if we if we unpack that, uh, one of the interesting findings of the report that we put out today is that about half of the overall increase in grocery prices can be attributed to a significant uh, increase in prices in three products, in uh, beef, in pork, and in poultry. And in beef and in pork, we've seen double-digit increases in prices over the last uh, couple of months. Um, in fact, if you look at the category that uh, is grocery prices, what economists call food at home, so food that is being uh, purchased uh, to eat at home, um, in a number of areas we've seen, if you take out those three categories, we've actually seen in, uh, price increases that are more in line with uh, historical norms. And we've seen some categories, for example, fresh fruits and vegetables prices have actually declined uh, since the end of last year. And if you look at a category of prices like eggs, um, obviously a similar uh, supply chain, similar input uh, and feed costs to poultry, um, uh, the price of eggs has actually come down over the last couple of months. The real drivers in these three areas, these three proteins. Um, if you look at that market, the thing that is striking is across uh, beef, uh, poultry, and, uh, and pork, significant consolidation in those industries. So anywhere from 55 to 85 percent of the market is controlled by the top four producers in those industries. And so when you see that level of consolidation and the increase in uh, prices, it raises a concern about pandemic profiteering, about companies that are driving price increases in a way that um, hurts consumers uh, uh, who are going to the grocery store and also isn't benefiting the actual producers, uh, the, um, uh, the farmers and the, uh, and the ranchers that are, are, growing, um, uh, are growing the product. Um, and uh, the, the report that we've outlined today details that in these industries, the four top uh, uh, companies in these industries have seen record or near record profits in the first and second quarter of this year um, and, and seen uh, near or approaching record gross margins as well. So we have a story of, of a consolidated industries with companies that are uh, generating record profits and then driving price increases for consumers without price, uh, without passing on those benefits to uh, the, the uh, underlying uh, producers. So uh, this raises for us uh, one of the issues that was core to the president's direction to all of us in his entire cabinet to focus on ways that promoting more competitive practices and more competition across industries could actually lower prices for consumers and benefit middle class families. And so um, with uh, Secretary Vilsack in the lead, we have been focused on steps that we can take uh, as a, a federal government to try to drive more price transparency, encourage greater competition uh, in this sector uh, in an effort to uh, help uh, ranchers, help farmers, uh, and help consumers uh, at the grocery store as well. This is part of the President's competition executive order that he signed a, f a few months back. We'll be holding the inaugural meeting of the President's Competition Council on Friday, at which this will be one of several issues uh, that we will discuss about promoting greater competition across the economy. 
But these steps are important, uh, and this effort is important because we're trying to also shine a light on the fact that uh, these price increases that are affecting uh, consumers um, are uh, are not uh, are, are not happening in isolation, and that companies are making decisions to drive these price increases. At the end of the day, what we want to do is work with uh, industry to try to generate better outcomes for end consumers, better outcomes for farmers. We think the steps that we're taking today can help move us in that direction. So without uh, further ado on that, I want to pass it over to Secretary Vilsack, who will talk about those steps that he is leading uh, on behalf of the administration. Brian, thanks very much. Uh, it's good to be with everyone today. Uh, you know, basically, the Department of Agriculture sees this in, as basically two, two functions, two responsibilities. Goal number one is to make sure that farmers get a fair return uh, for their efforts and their capital investment. And the second goal is to make sure that when consumers go to the grocery store and at the checkout counter, they get fair prices. Uh, and the reality is today that farmers are losing money on cattle, on hogs, uh, and poultry that they're selling at a time when consumers are seeing higher prices at the grocery store, and as Brian alluded to, uh, the fact that there are now record profits or near record profits for those in the middle. Uh, so part of this is a function of consolidation and, and concentration, and we've learned during the pandemic that this is also a resiliency issue. Uh, when there was a major disruption in processing capacity because there are so few uh, processors, we saw significant uh, disruption at the marketplace as well. So this administration is focused on, on, on four major steps to try to take uh, a, a action in this area. First, strengthening the current regulatory system that we have, our Packers and Stockyards Act, uh, to make sure that we are identifying and holding people accountable for unfair and discriminatory practices. And that regulatory changes are, are now being uh, undertaken uh, as we speak. Secondly is to make sure that there's adequate price discovery in the market. Uh, because there is such consolidation, uh, there is very little cash transaction that takes place in this market, and so it's very difficult to determine whether or not the prices that are being paid to, to farmers are fair. And so we are uh, producing studies, uh, recently a, a couple of studies to provide more uh, price uh, discovery. Uh, certainly uh, want to work with Congress in their efforts uh, legislatively to pass legislation that will expand the capacity for us to have information. A third, we want to make sure that when people go into the grocery store and they see things that are labeled, uh, a product of the U.S. But we want to make sure that consumers fully understand and appreciate precisely what that means or what it doesn't mean, and whether people are taking advantage of whatever value-added opportunity that might present uh, to increase price. And finally, uh, expanding uh, processing capacity and maintaining the small and, and, and very small processing uh, facilities that are dotting the landscape today. Uh, we provided additional resources uh, to keep those small uh, processing companies in business recently by announcing about 150 to 160 million dollars of assistance and help and we have put together a 500 million dollar effort uh, to work with states and local governments uh, as well as nonprofit organizations and the livestock industry to look for ways in which we can finance uh, expanded processing capacity we're doing this at the same time that agriculture is confronted not just with uh, the issue of concentration and consolidation but also the impacts and effects of severe weather uh, which are linked in part to climate. Whether it's forest fires or drought or hurricanes, uh, obviously that's also causing a disruption. And as we build this broader uh, processing capacity, we also want to build a more resilient food system. Uh, and right now we're deeply concerned about the impacts and effects of drought on these beef prices and pork prices and poultry prices because it could lead potentially to people uh, having to sell their herds uh, because they can't simply afford the cost of maintaining them. Uh, particularly in the western part of the U.S. For that reason, we've looked at a number of different steps to try to provide help and assistance uh, to deal with the drought, and today we identified yet another way in which we can provide help and assistance. Uh, historically, we've always uh, uh, provided resources to farmers to be able to pay for the cost of hauling water uh, to their facilities. If they had uh, a situation with a drought and they needed to access additional water, there's a cost associated with that, and we helped to defer some of that expense. We're now changing that program, uh, the Emergency Livestock uh, Assistance Program called ELAP. We're now changing that to include also assistance and help for transportation expense for feed. We know that these farmers, particularly in the western U.S., are going to be confronted with having to truck or rail feed from far distances, and that's going to be an incredibly uh, increased cost to them. So we're going to use this emergency program 
to provide up to 60% of the additional costs that they're incurring above and beyond what they would normally incur uh, for transportation expense. And for limited resource farmers, uh, it could be as high as much uh, as 90% of assistance and help. And the goal here is to focus on those areas that have been designated uh, serious drought areas, D2 for eight consecutive weeks, or D3 or greater. Uh, the hope is that by providing this resource, we'll be able to make it easier for farmers to stay in business uh, and therefore not uh, basically create more disruption in the market. So a combination of focusing on concentration and consolidation, as well as making sure that we continue to look for ways to make the system more resilient, uh, are, are, are steps that we're taking uh, pursuant to the President's uh, directive. Okay. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Uh, Mr. Secretary Frank, could you guys go, please go back to this? Um, <coughs> This, this pandemic profiteering that you mentioned, um, you said there are up to 85% of the market is controlled by the top four industry uh, big names. So are, are these the companies that are uh, that you suspect of profiteering right now? Forgive me if this is an ignorant question. What are these companies? Who are they? What are the top four? And what specifically are you seeing as it relates to this profiteering? Sure. Let me let me just start, and then yeah, and the yeah. secretary should jump in. I think so. Um, with respect with respect to with respect to the data, um, if you look at the the beef industry, for example, the top four the top four meat processors control eighty five percent of the market. That's in contrast to I, I mentioned the issue of eggs earlier, where um, a, a far less concentrated. The top four uh, 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 pr processors there uh, <laughs> control about thirty percent of the market. And what we've seen is that those uh, those four uh, four companies, uh, those four co those four companies, we, we get into details. It includes JBS, Tyson. Um, uh, we but we, we it, it, it's in the report that we put out. Um, those companies have seen record or near record profits uh, in the first half of this year, um, and that has coincided with a period where we've seen disproportionate in increase in prices in those segments. Uh, and that that actually is driving um, about half of the increase in overall uh, grocery prices and overall food and uh, uh, food away from uh, f food at home prices. Um, and so it raises this question of in this consolidated industry, are those price increases being driven uh, by, uh, you know, being passed on to the the uh, the, uh, the 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 growers? And what we see, the real concern we have is that consumers are facing higher prices, and the growers are not uh, getting paid higher, and that raises real concern and a real question, which is what's motivating this, this focus and the actions that we're taking. Well, and I would just simply say, uh, you know, the, there, there's a reason for concern here. Um, Department of Justice uh, recently had a price-fixing case uh, involving Tyson, uh, where uh, clearly uh, there was some wrongdoing that took place. And so it's not something that we are, um, you know, it's not something we're, we're dreaming up here. Uh, the, the profits are, are real. The fact that producers are not making a profit. I mean, I remember talking to a producer the other day in Council Bluffs, and he said, I don't get this, Mr. Secretary. He said, I just sold my cattle, and I lost $150 a head. But the processor made $1,800 a head. How can that be? Uh, yes, I'm Secretary Vilsack. Um, two questions. One, you're saying profiteering. Would you go as far as price gouging as well as saying that word price gouging, those words price gouging? And then also, as you talk about farmers right now in this moment, in this season of COVID, in this season of hurt, I want to go to the black farmer. Um, there is an effort by this administration to help the black farmer uh, that Lindsey Graham has said is reparations. Could you give us the state of the black farmer as you're talking about average farmers right now? Sure. Uh, let me answer that question, the last question first. Uh, there are now 13 separate uh, lawsuits uh, that are directed at the debt relief efforts uh, that were passed the American Rescue Plan. We're obviously going through the process of litigation, building the record, and we'll proceed. In the meantime, you know, we're really focused on, uh, on, on those farmers who are distressed, those farmers who are uh, low-income farmers. And uh, just to give you a sense of this, 89.6 percent of American farmers today, today, do not make a majority of their income from farming. Uh, and so that is a call to action. Uh, and that's why in the American Rescue Plan, uh, the President and Congress included a provision that is encouraging us to take a look at ways in which we can expand market access and land access for those uh, financially stressed farmers. So one of the things we did, with again, with the American Rescue Plan, is we identified procurement 
Uh, we've purchased a lot of emergency food for food banks. Uh, in the past, we have purchased that food from large-scale distributors, probably some of whom are doing business with JBS and Tyson and Smithfield and so forth. But we think maybe it would be a good idea for us to also use a few of those procurement dollars to help local and regional distributors and to focus and direct some of those resources as well on, uh, on, on low-income, distressed farmers, producers. So we are now using our, uh, what we refer to as our flexible TFAP program, our temporary assistance program, to use resources to basically create market opportunities, to create better balance and greater resiliency in the system. We just can't have this concentration on just, you know, focusing on just a few. We need to have greater diversity uh, across, the across the board here. So we're looking for ways to increase market, increase uh, land access, uh, make it easier, uh, obviously, on the debt side, and that's uh, that, that's uh, that's that's going on. Well, what about the profiteering versus price gouging? Well, I look ag again. If if I'm losing $150 a head on my cattle, and the guy who's buying it from me, who's forcing me to take that price, is charging and making $1,800 a head, I don't know what you call it, but what I do know is that our job is to make sure that that farmer gets a fair price and that the producer, uh, that the when I go to the grocery store and I'm in the checkout line, I'm paying a fair price. I'm not paying more than I should. Uh, and, and right now, because of the concentration, we have two issues here. One, we have the issue of fairness, and two, we have the issue of resiliency. Any one of these facilities, uh, whether it's a cyber attack in JBS or whether it's uh, uh, COVID basically shutting down some of Tyson's facilities, it causes disruption in the market. We need a much more resilient system. Uh, one for each of you, Brian, for you, how did you integrate uh, climate into this decision? I think meat production and consumption is one of the leading uh, uh, greenhouse gas emitting uh, areas of the, of the uh, economy uh, and don't higher prices kind of disincentivize uh, 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 that kind of behavior. And then for you, Secretary Vilsack, we asked you this in May, but where are you on the uh, Twin Metals uh, copper mine decision? Are you going to allow that or are you going to block that? Sure. Yeah, so, so on, the, on, the, on the first, the goal, and, and, and just to pick up on something that the Secretary just said, our goal here is to work with industry to get to a better outcome that is, uh, ends up with a fair outcome for consumers and a fair outcome for American uh, farmers. And when uh, the lack of competition doesn't benefit, uh, you know, that we want to work with industry because actually the lack of competition also leads to resiliency issues. And one of the things that we've seen, I mean, we, we all have experienced in this pandemic is that a serial underinvestment in the resilience of supply chains, coupled with consolidation in particular industries, left our economy extraordinarily vulnerable. Um, and we continue to live with the consequences of that. And so in that context, uh, we, you know, we, think it's pretty, we think it's pretty important not only to address the very practical issue uh, that Secretary Vilsack is describing about the market dynamics, but also to remind everybody that we just lived through an extraordinary period of time where demand for these products was sustained by extraordinary government action. Uh, incredibly appropriate to make sure that food insecurity um, and other basic human needs uh, didn't fall off during this pandemic. But at the same time, Going back uh, and to you know to to, to borrow uh, a phrase the president has, uh, uh, drills into us every day without building back better to a more resilient system puts all of us at risk on the question and and resilience is also important with respect to the uh, the realities of the a climate affected uh, world and a climate affected country uh, and those involve the kind of investments that Secretary Vilsack was talking about in having more resilience against the reality of more frequent and severe extreme weather events um, but also transitioning our agricultural system to be part of an effort to actually reduce emissions across the board I think you know we have at, with, with the secretary's leadership the most ambitious strategy uh, of, 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 any, of any administration in history that the agricultural sector will actually be part of moving us and creating new markets uh, uh, in, uh, as, we, uh, as we address climate change. But we can do that in a way that actually doesn't end up in a situation where American consumers are, are left paying higher prices and American farmers are left uh, with, with less income. That's sort of over too. Mara? Yeah, um, you mentioned the- sorry, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. I, I just want to underscore that point, and then I'll, I'll answer your twin metals. Uh, the, the fact that we can create new revenue streams for these farmers by conversion of agricultural waste into a variety of products basically will mean that that, far, that farmer gets a fair re, fairer return, a broader return, more return 
on his or her investment, and that consumer gets a decent price at the at, at the uh, at the counter. Uh, that's not an that that is a possibility. It's a real possibility in this administration. With the passage of the reconciliation bill uh, and the build back uh, the infrastructure bill, we'll have the resources to be able to create that kind of new opportunity. On twin metals, we continue to wait for the Department of Interior. They have to issue a, a legal opinion before we know what direction we need to take at US, uh, USDA. It's, it's conditioned upon the DOI. We're waiting for the DOI. Mark? Yeah. You mentioned that uh, DOJ has a price fixing case against Tyson. How much of the profiteering and the lack of competition do you think is illegal, and what are you going to do about it? Well, so I, I, we, I want to be very clear that the um, the, the President's executive order directs the Department of Justice and the FTC to train their enforcement on potential illegal activities, including price fixing and price gouging. We are going to leave that to the enforcement agencies. Uh, um, that's their appropriate role and not, uh, not for uh, uh, the, the, uh, the White House to uh, interfere with. What we are focused on here is policy, uh, policy issues that can actually help to get at the underlying issue of concentration. So, for example, the investment that Secretary Vilsack was talking about in encouraging more entrance, more small and new entrance into this market, that's the kind of step that we can take to help encourage more competition and help reduce the likelihood that concentration leads to the opportunity for those type of illegal activities. But with respect to the, enforce the specific enforcement issues, both um, as they've resolved or as they may be ongoing, we would leave that to the FTC. Do you have a sense of how much of this problem is illegal? Regardless of the enforcement and what DOJ is going to do about it, I'm just asking you, is it like 10 percent, 50 percent? How much of this uh, uh, consolidation and profiteering is illegal in your, in your mind? Right. Precisely because I'm going to leave those investigations to those agencies, I'm not going to speculate on I'm not going to speculate on the, on, 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 on the work that they uh, have undergoing. What I can tell you is that our, you know, we, view, we believe this is a problem. We believe that this is a problem that's affecting consumers uh, uh, and farmers alike, and we believe that there are concrete steps that we need to take and that we can take to try to help improve. We don't. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, farmers want you to reverse the Trump administration's decision to dissolve GIPSA. So there is an independent agency that can focus on promoting competition and fair trade practices instead of being buried into AMS. Are you going to reestablish GIPSA? Well, that's a slightly different uh, area. Uh, the, the GIPSA basically takes a look at uh, grading uh, grain and things of that nature, okay? It's not really into the Packers and Stockyards area. What farmers really want us to do is what we are doing, uh, which is to enforce the Packers and Stockyards and strengthen that. That's the vehicle by which you can determine whether the poultry tournament system, for example, is fairly uh, compensating poultry farmers or whether there is a circumstance where uh, Packers are, are discriminating or unfairly treating producers. So th that's our focus right now, is making sure that the Packers and Stockyards Act is strengthened. You know, we're going to continue to do the grading necessary to make sure that people understand what a, uh, you know, a grade two corn is uh, and that meets a certain standard. I don't think you necessarily have to reinstitute GYPSA to do that, but you do have to focus on the Packers and Stockyards Act. It was disbanded. You know, you know a lot of farmers were very concerned. Are you saying you think that they can operate stronger the way it is structured under AMS than it was before, they, before Trump? They can operate stronger when you have the enforcement tools and mechanisms with the Packers and Stockyards. That's what's been missing. It isn't so much the structure or where within AMS this would, this would still be within AMS. It would just be a, a missionary within AMS. It isn't that. That's not the issue. The issue is what tools do we have if there is an unfair practice taking place, or if there's a discriminatory practice, if the poultry system is not treating poultry producers fairly, what, what tools do we have? Right now we don't have very strong tools. We are strengthening those tools so we can call out bad behavior. Thank you. Hey, Brian, just to broaden it out a little bit, between the EO public comments, the, some letters you've sent, you guys have made clear you want on the enforcement side of things to be more aggressive than they have been in the past. Uh, are you and the President comfortable that the enforcement uh, arms of these agencies have been as aggressive as you want them to be? And I, I guess secondly, uh, there's some sense inside the White House that just taking this posture may preemptively cause companies to lower prices or be more willing. Uh, have you seen any tangible results tied to that? So on, on the first uh, on the first question, uh, the answer is uh, yes and. 
uh, the President's executive order directed the creation of a competition council precisely so that we can get the appropriate uh, federal agencies, both um, uh, the, 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 the cabinet agencies and the independent agencies together. Um, to make sure that we are all working as effectively as possible toward, toward the goal of that executive order. So on Friday, uh, we will be convening uh, with, uh, uh, with Attorney General Garland and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and um, uh, a number of the other uh, relevant uh, agencies uh, to discuss steps that, uh, that each agency is independently taking, but then how these all work together. And the truth is that you know, just that information sharing uh, is incredibly important because you know, some of these issues that we're talking about here are intimately related to logistics and transportation issues. So the steps that you know, uh, Secretary, um, Secretary Buttigieg is taking, uh, the Department of Transportation, uh, with respect to our ports and our trucking uh, and logistics, you can't, you, know, you can't effectively solve these issues uh, without having that cross-functional approach. So we'll continue to do that and continue to stay focused at the President's direction on making sure that we're living up to uh, the commitments on the executive order. With respect to your second question, certainly we believe that it's long overdue to have a clear public focus on competition and enforcing antitrust statutes. Um, it's probably... It's, it's probably been some time, I don't know, ever. It may be the first time ever that GYPSA was issued from the, uh, from the, the podium at the uh, uh, But, you know, uh, some time to have the Secretary of Agriculture stating a priority, the uh, enforcement of the Packards and Stockyards Act. Uh, and we believe that that does send an important signal to the market uh, and that these steps uh, in the aggregate send uh, uh, signals. Certainly, we've seen some. You know, we, we've seen some instances. Uh, there's been some mergers that 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 uh, that you and others have uh, have covered recently. Um, uh, so I think that we are. You know, we are we are hopeful uh, that uh, by making clear that this is a priority, uh, that we can bring industry together to more constructively try to solve these issues, and including you know ultimately the decisions that you know private companies will make. All right, we'll do that tomorrow, Alex. Um, maybe the secretary can uh, speak to this. Do you have a sense of when these moves will be felt by consumers and sort of trickle down into lower prices? Because these are problems that are pretty systemic and have been going on for a while. And then I have a question for Brian about the economy overall. Well, there's no question that our intent is to try to get these processing uh, plants and projects uh, going very quickly. Uh, we've already been able to identify a couple of projects uh, that would be helped by our resources. And so I think you will expect to see at the end of this year and early next year some progress there. That's going to send a strong message, to Brian's point, uh, to the industry uh, that there's going to be competition and they're going to have to respond and react to it. Uh, so the hope would be uh, that they do, they respond accordingly and that, again, par farmers get fair prices and the consumers are getting fair prices at the uh, grocery store. And then, Brian, on the economy, the uh, White House has long been promoting these very strong uh, projections for the growth of the economy. Uh, this week, though, Goldman Sachs downgraded its projections for, for the economy. So has the White House overpromised? Are you at all concerned that you've set, set expectations too high at this point? So I, it's a it's it's a it's a it's a good question, uh, and I think it's also one in which you know the the the, the private forecaster that you mentioned uh, downgraded its forecast, um, but even with the downgraded forecast, growth in 2021 would be the strongest that we've seen in uh, in decades. So uh, what we are seeing, I think, is the record and historic strength of this recovery. Um, uh, not just historically compared to other recoveries from, uh, from crises and recessions in the United States, but record globally right now. The United States is the only developed country where GDP has already recovered to its pre-pandemic level. That has, that, that's happened nowhere else uh, in the world. The strength of, the, of, of, our, the, of economic growth and of growth in the labor market is sufficient that uh, we can continue to see strong growth even as we deal with uh, uh, with unanticipated circumstances, even as we work through uh, the COVID, uh, uh, the Delta challenges that the president will uh, speak to tomorrow. So, uh, so we continue to uh, be focused on the fact of trying to, how can we continue to build momentum into that recovery? Uh, but even as we see these step downs, I think the thing that is most notable about that is that even with these uh, headwinds, we're seeing the United States continue to outpace our international peers and continue to outpace our historic progress uh, uh, for you know recoveries um, 
at similar points in recoveries. All right, Josh. Thank you. Can, sorry, can you just circle back to the what the DOJ active file is? Your blog mentioned it was a poultry investigation, but a year ago there was a civil one launched aimed at beef. Is there one on pork? And are you adding or expanding these investigations? Because this seems where the real teeth would be, right? If you gave DOJ <coughs> more firepower of some kind to, to pursue this. Uh, the, one, the, the, the case I mentioned was a poultry case. Uh, so that's, uh, I'm not. Poultry and beef going on now, but not pork. Uh, I'm not aware of a pork case. There could be, but I'm not aware of it. Okay. okay. Uh, that's sort of outside of our jurisdiction. The only time we ever get engaged in this is if the Department of Justice contacts us and says, hey, we need some information or data. Uh, we, it's not that we precipitate those investigations. It's a Department of Justice function, uh, appropriately so. What we are doing uh, I I in terms of the tools uh, the Department of Justice has the capacity and the ability, and they, and they exercise it uh, uh, under their current statutory uh, uh, framework. What we don't have, what we're now going to get, are tools that will allow us to take more uh, definitive action, more aggressive action, when we see unfair and discriminatory practices. We don't have that power now. We tried to get it during the Obama administration. Congress blocked it. Uh, we now think we're in a position to move forward on this, and we're going to aggressively move forward on it. Any of those cases obviously raise the question of whether you're interested in looking at breaking up these companies somehow. Is that what the administration is? Well, I think the fact. No, I think the fact that we have put five hundred million dollars on the table, and basically have begun a process of reaching out to states, uh, to farm organizations, to philanthropic organizations, and asking the question, "What could you do with this resource?" that would allow us to significantly increase the processing capacity in this country in places where we know there is a need for this, where there are not competitive markets. Uh, and the reaction to this has been quite favorable. Uh, I would anticipate and expect that this $500 million is going to leverage additional resources from those sources. And I think, I, I think we're going to find out that maybe we're onto something here. Uh, and we may end up looking at numbers uh, uh, north of 500 million. You're more interested in, I guess, incentivizing or pr building production outside uh, these big four, uh, uh, rather uh, than breaking up the big four. I'm looking at what I have power to do, right. and I have power to basically put the 500 million dollars on the table. I have power to do packers and stockyards. I have power to do more price discovery. I, I, I have power to to take a look at, at product labels to make sure that they're not misrepresenting or confusing. Uh, customers and consumers, and that's what we're doing. We're doing everything we have the power to do, and we're strengthening the tools to be able to do it. Can you quickly address the debt limit question? Secretary Yellen wrote uh, Speaker Pelosi today, warning about that. Uh, what is your read of that? How much time do you have left until the debt limit becomes a problem? To you start facing your well, on the time question, I would just refer you exactly to Secretary Yellen. I don't have anything to add to Secretary Yellen's letter, uh, which outlined uh, her current, the, the Treasury's current projection uh, of uh, exhaustion. Uh, and more generally, I would just underscore that um, this is a responsibility, uh, a, a sacred responsibility that, that Congress has to operate um, in a, uh, a bipartisan way uh, to raise or suspend the debt limit to address the fact that um, these are the, this, this is a reflection of actions and legislation that Congress has already passed. And so there's often, you know, a confusion or conflation when it talks to the debt limits. So, but just to clarify and, and resolve, the debt limit um, is a function of uh, bills that Congress has already, uh, has already passed and already racked up. In fact, 97 percent uh, of the debt under question um, is associated with actions that happened before this president he was even taken into office. Uh, and in fact, even if, uh, even if Congress took no future action ever, did nothing else uh, uh, in the future, uh, Congress would have to uh, raise or suspend the debt limit because it's a reflection of actions already taken. And so our expectation is that Congress uh, will do so, and will do so as it has done historically, as it did three times under President Trump, uh, and operate in a bipartisan way to address this issue. Um, so that's our expectation. And a decade ago, one of the fallbacks was something called prioritization, where you sort of decide who gets paid and who doesn't. Is the, have you, is the administration going down this road at all? Is, is that the fallback plan if the limit isn't raised or suspended? Our, our, our expectation is that Congress is going to act and uh, act responsibly um, and uh, consistent with its responsibility. Uh, so that's our, that's our expectation and our focus. Okay. Thank you, Secretary Gilstead. Thank you to our NEC Director. Thank you.
Okay. Okay, I don't know that I have anything else at the top. Uh, I know we've covered a lot of bait ground there. I'm happy that the gypsa question was answered by my <laughs> colleagues there, Ouija, relieved. Um, Alex, why don't you kick us off? Sure. Um, so the president's remarks on the pandemic tomorrow, can you preview any of what we should expect from him? And then also, I wanted to ask you, you know, he's talked a lot about defeating the pandemic in the past. You yesterday said that his remarks tomorrow will address how you'll get the pandemic under control. So are we shifting to a point at which this pandemic can no longer be defeated and we need to sort of live with it and figure out how to get it under control? Is that where the White House is now? Well, first let me say on your first question. So the president right now is meeting with members of his COVID team uh, to talk about a range of steps, uh, including his plan uh, he'll announce tomorrow, six steps to stop the spread of Delta and increase vaccinations. And to kind of get to your second question, and then I'll go through some of the preview, uh, we want to be specific about what we're trying to accomplish in this moment and what these six steps will do. We know that increasing vaccinations will stop the spread of the pandemic, will get the pandemic under control, will return people to normal life. That's what our objective is. So we want to be specific about what we're trying to achieve. Uh, but I would just know Note that what you're going to hear from the president tomorrow is going to build on some of the steps that the president announced over the course of the last few months. We've been at war with uh, with the virus for a long time, several months, more than a year, year and a half. Uh, we have been uh, working, we've been at war with the Delta variant over the course of the last couple of months. And just to remind you of some of the steps that we've announced, uh, we've announced new government mandates on uh, DOD, our military forces, NIH, uh, other the, the VA, uh, the, the Veterans Affairs, uh, Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, uh, folks who are serving on the front lines on the health, uh, on health in health roles in that department. We've also incentivized additional mandates, uh, whether it is in uh, home on health care facilities, nursing homes, and others. And we've also lifted up and uh, and incentivized private sector uh, set private sector mandates because we've seen that they have been effective. We've also deployed over 700 surge response teams across the country, and uh, work closely uh, again with the private sector to institute more requirements on vaccination. And we've seen some impact from those steps. Tens of millions of Americans are now covered by vaccination requirements. 14 million Americans got their first shot in August, which was an increase from what we'd seen in the months prior, 4 million more than in July. And the increase in vaccinations has been a consistent trend. But uh, he's going to lay out these six steps tomorrow because we have more work to do. And we are still at war with the virus and with the Delta variant. So we're going to build on that work. Uh, and he's speaking to it now because uh, this issue, of course, is on front of mind, top of mind to Americans across the country. Uh, people are returning to schools. Uh, workplaces are either reopening some brick and mortar or some people are just returning to work after spending some time with family or loved ones over the summer. So he's going to outline the next phase in the, in the fight and against the virus and what that looks like, including measures to work with the public and private sector, building on the steps that we've already announced, the steps we've taken over the last few months, requiring more vaccinations, boosting important testing measures, and more, uh, making it safer for kids to go to school, all at a time when the American people are listening. Again, this will be six steps that we'll work to be implementing over the months ahead. And then Boosters. Uh, the WHO, the head of the WHO, is calling on basically rich countries with vaccine surpluses to hold off on booster shots until the end of the year. Um, what's the White House response to that? And uh, is it ethical to start moving forward with booster shots at a time when so many countries are barely starting with their first shots? Well. Our view is that this is a, a false choice, uh, and the United States has donated and shared uh, about 140 million doses with over 90 countries, more than all other countries combined. We're donating half a billion doses to 100 countries in need. Last week, we announced a plan to invest $2.7 billion in manufacturing critical vaccine inputs and expanded fill-finish lines at factories. From Senegal to South Africa to India, we've made significant investments in boosting global productions of COVID vaccines. At the same time, the President and this administration has a responsibility to do everything we can to protect people in the United States in this country. And and as our health advisors have recommended uh, additional booster shots, uh, we are working to implement that. Our view is we can do both. I'd also note that there are, in addition to access to vaccine doses, uh, one of the reasons that we have invested in areas like uh, manufacturing critical vaccine inputs, expanded fill finish, is because sometimes the issues are also 
about distribution channels, about having enough uh, personnel who are trained to distribute these shots, manufacturing capacity, certain uh, access to certain uh, components that go into vaccines. We're working through those as well. But we are doing both. We think we can do both, and we will continue to do both from the United States. Go ahead. So a couple of questions on Texas. Uh, the governor there was asked about the uh, lack of an exception for rape or incest in the abortion law. And I don't know if you heard his comments, but he said uh, his answer to that question was that Texas will work tirelessly to make sure that we eliminate rapists off the street. And I'm just wondering if the White House has a response to, to that. Well, if Governor Abbott has a means of eliminating all rapists or all rape uh, from the United States, then there'd be bipartisan support for that. Uh, but given there has never in history of the country in the world been any leader who's ever been able to eliminate rape, eliminate rapists from our streets, it's even more imperative. It's one of the many reasons, I should say, not the only reason, why women in Texas should have access to health care. So it does not change our objectives, does not change our commitment. Uh, the Department of Justice, the Attorney General, announced a step on Monday. Uh, our Department of Justice is continuing to look at legal options. Our Department of Health and Human Services is also continuing to look at all options. And the President has made clear uh, that it's a priority to do everything we can to ensure women in Texas have access to health care. I, I want to push a little bit on that front just looking at options. Um, you know, for women who are in Texas right now who might be in need of having an abortion, who per perhaps are looking at this White House for a Hail Mary intervention, uh, yeah. the clock is ticking for them. The clock is literally ticking for them today. So in terms of their decision making, uh, can this administration offer any help to them now? What, what would you tell these women who are looking to this White House to help them? What is help on the way? Well, we would tell them first that this, this law is a violation of your rights, and we are going to do everything we can to provide assistance as quickly as we can. One of the reasons why the Department of Health and Human Services is a key component here is obviously because they oversee the nation's health care systems, but they are going to look for ways to, to make sure we are providing access to health care to women in Texas. I, I noted that the Department of Justice announced a step that they were taking on Monday. Uh, clearly, uh, this law is, uh, is or this, this bill that was signed into law is something we strongly oppose, and there's an urgency to uh, looking for and announcing actions to help women now. And certainly, we understand that women are looking at their choices right now, today, tomorrow, last week, um, and we are hopeful we will have more to convey to them directly. But in terms of tangible help that's on the way, would the White House support the FDA lifting restrictions on mifepristone, the abortion, so-called abortion pill? This is a decision that the FDA uh, has to make uh, on their own based on science. And uh, certainly we believe in the independence of the FDA to make these decisions, and we know that there are a number of advocates who have called for that, but we'll leave that decision to the FDA. Go ahead. Um, the, the January 6th uh, Commission has asked for a number of documents from executive agencies um, pertaining to actions by the prior administration. Mm -hmm. um, I believe the deadline for complying with that is tomorrow. Um, is the administration going to um, assist in that investigation in the way that they have asked, or are you going to assert executive privilege? For, for uh, documents from the prior administration? Yes. I would have to check. Well, a number of these, though, I know we've had conversations about this before, and I'd have to check with the counsel's office, are not in the White House. Uh, they are uh, documents that often go to the archives or other localities that are not overseen by the White House. So I'd have to check and see what documents we would actually have access to here, or if there are other places, uh, parts of government, that uh, would be the ones who would have control of these documents. I check if the White House counsel is going to weigh in on that decision, would, would your recommendation to those agencies be to comply or to assert uh, that? Again, if, if there are, if we're talking about uh, documents in the National Archives, that wouldn't be our purview here. Those would be documents, and I think we've had discussions along these lines before, so I'd have to check on whether there is any applicability to anything we've had over, we would have oversight uh, of from this White House currently. Okay, and then one economic question, there was Labor Department data this morning that showed a record number of job openings, 10.9 million uh, job openings. But we also still have millions of people who are unemployed and been sitting on the sidelines for a very long time. I'm um, just curious if there's any new um, approach that the administration is going to take to um, helping employers get their jobs 
uh, filled. It's 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 curtailing uh, economic growth. So well, I think you're talking about the JOLTS data, yes. which is rel which is pertains to July data. So it is a little bit old uh, at this point in time, given we're into September, and we've seen jobs numbers come out in that period of time, where we've seen that still an average of 700,000 jobs per month are being. Uh, created or people are being matched with jobs in that period of time. Uh, look, I think what we look at is the data uh, across the period of time, uh, across a broad period of time. We know uh, our empl employers are continuing to look for uh, workers to hire and worker power is rising as workers have more choices available to them. Uh, and that continues to be the case. And we believe that having workers empowered is a good sign. Uh, we are also seeing uh, that we are continuing, we've created now to date 4 million uh, new jobs, uh, more jobs than any other administration in this period of time in American history. That's also a good sign. So I would say that as we look at our uh, efforts here, uh, we look at um, whether employers, or we recommend, of course, whether employers are offering uh, a livable wage, whether they're offering benefits to attract workers, and we're also seeing continued positive signs in month-over-month -month trends as it relates to the economy and job creation. Go ahead. Uh, is there any sense, you know, when you look at the uptick in vaccinations, uh, mandates and requirements, I think are broadly popular when you look at polling around the country right now, mm -hmm. um, given the scale of the Delta surge that's continued over months, that perhaps you should have been more aggressive earlier when it came to uh, pursuing policies like that? Well, we have seen, yes, they're not only popular, but they are also effective. Uh, we've also known as, say, the federal government as one of the biggest employers in the country that uh, we knew we would take a, an approach uh, over time uh, to implement uh, any mandates or mandates that would require vaccination by employees. Uh, there are some companies out there that were waiting for final approval by the FDA. Uh, there uh, also were some companies that wanted a period of time to implement mandates. That's all understandable. So our view is this is certainly one of the ways that we've seen uh, more people get vaccinated. We've seen it be effective, and we've seen it rise in approval and support across the country as people who are vaccinated are increasingly popular. But all we can do at this point is look forward and uh, determine how we can take steps now to continue to uh, get more people vaccinated and uh, get the pandemic under control. And then one on um, the, the flights that have been stuck in Afghanistan. I understand the state is leading on this, but you guys have made clear you're paying very close attention to the American citizens still in the country. I'm trying to square where things actually stand. The sure. Secretary of State said a couple of times it was a documentation issue. A U.S. Senator, Richard Blumenthal, pushed back vociferously on that. Today, the Secretary of State said the Taliban are not permitting the charter flights to leave and putting it precisely on them. What's your understanding of the holdup? And if the Taliban is preventing them, what levers do you have right now? Well, there a couple pieces are true here. Um, so one is we are continuing to press the Taliban, the Secretary of State is, uh, to do more to abide by uh, allowing American citizens, uh, individuals with uh, who are legal permanent residents, and individuals with proper documentation to depart the country. Uh, it is also true uh, that uh, we don't have a role in preventing flights from taking off. We are not on the ground. So that is not something the U.S. government is doing. Uh, but at the same time, some of these planes and some of the issues is where are they going to land? So a number of these planes, uh, they may have a handful of American citizens, but they may have several hundred individuals where we don't have manifests for them. We don't know what the security protocols are for them. We don't know what their documentation is. And there is a fundamental question, and this is one of the hard choices you face in government. Are we going to allow a plane with hundreds of people where we don't know who they are, we don't know what security protocols have been put in place, to land on a U.S. military base? And there are reasonable questions, justified questions, I think, uh, as to why we wouldn't do that. Um, and so right now there are some charter planes that are taking off. We do have to make evaluations about the safety and security and protocols in place as planes are landing on military bases. And there are some challenges uh, as it relates to documentation, where a number of people may not have documentation, some for good reason, uh, because they're trying to depart Afghanistan. But that is something we're, we're working through. These, these handful of American citizens, we are also in touch with. They are not the majority of these flights. Far from it. It is a small number of, of American citizens who are we're talking about on these charter flights. Can I follow up on that, uh, please, Jen? So sure. are you essentially saying that 
Uh, is the administration essentially saying, I'm picking up from what Secretary Blinken has said today about documentation, is the administration essentially saying that Taliban is the only one who has access and who's able to check passenger documentation against these flight manifests? And if so, uh, what is stopping the U.S., for example, from sending personnel over there to do this job and to allow these passengers to leave on the flights? I understand they're not all Americans, but many of them are Afghan allies. Well, none of that is what I said or what the Secretary of State said. So let me try again. So there are the flights. We obviously don't have personnel on the ground. That's correct. We don't. Uh, what our objective is, and we have a presence in Qatar, right, as you know, our Secretary of State has been on the ground in Qatar, is negotiating and having discussions as we speak with international partners, and also members of our State Department are in discussions with the Taliban, because we do want to work through and ensure that we can allow additional flights to land uh, at military bases. But it is also true that we are not going to allow flights to land where we don't know what security protocols have been taken, whether people have been vetted, who is on these, who are on these planes. And I don't think the vast majority of American citizens want us to do that either. So right now, we are working through this process, and we are also in touch with the American citizens who are on these flights or who are in the vicinity, which are a very small number, to work through getting them out of Afghanistan. We are committed to that. We absolutely want to do that. We've already evacuated a handful of people, and we're continuing to work through. Now, things that will make it much easier for certain are if Qatari Airlines, we're working with them to see if they can get flights up and operational, more efforts to get uh, individuals evacuated over land. We're working through all of these components, and it's the reason why the Secretary of State is on the ground in the region discussing and negotiating as we speak. Okay, we're going to keep going. Go ahead, Mija. I, I think I answered your question. Go ahead, Mija. Thanks, Jen. I wanted to follow up on the uh, president's speech tomorrow. Sure. You mentioned schools and private sectors as two areas of mm -hmm. focus, but you've also been very, um, you know, firm in maintaining independence between the federal government and what schools and pr the private sector does. So tomorrow, should we just anticipate the president to say much of what he's already said to urge those entities to take action, or will there be something new that's actionable? There will be new steps the president announces tomorrow, absolutely. And will any of those new steps influence uh, the average American's day-to-day -day life? Should we expect any new mitigation recommendations, as an example? It depends on if you're vaccinated or not. So Go ahead. It's possible that sure. there's something new. There are, there, are six new, there are six steps the President's announcing. There will be new components, as I noted and you noted. Uh, some of that will be related to access to testing. Some will be related to uh, mandates. Uh, some will be related to how we ensure kids are protected in schools. And we'll have more. We'll preview more tomorrow as all the pieces are finalized. But there will be new components um, that, sure, will, of course, impact people across the country. But we're also all working together to get the, uh, the virus under control, to return to our, our normal lives. And uh, I know many people, I'm sure, are looking forward to hearing what the president has to say. And then just one quick yeah. follow-up on timing. Um, we're just a few days away from September 11th. Do you have any update on when the DOJ might release those FBI documents related to the investigation? I don't. It's it's their process. They're obviously overseeing. I think we said uh, a couple of weeks ago we didn't anticipate that process would necessarily be done in advance of September 11th. It's really based on their timing. It's not a deadline. I don't think that they've set for that. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Following up on these charter flights that the Taliban is holding up in Afghanistan, the Secretary of State said there are limits to what we can do without personnel on the ground. Yeah. You just said we are not on the ground. You're right. Whose fault is that? I don't think this is about fault here. Well, I'm, I'm convinced. I think what people want to understand is what we're doing to help address it. There's a handful of Americans, and I'm sure you're not suggesting we should have flights with hundreds of people we don't know who they okay. are, where there's How no security Americans protocols. Too few to go in. Too few. I, I just am conveying to you there's a handful of Americans who we are also in touch with, and we are working to help get evacuated from Afghanistan. But decisions you have to make in the federal government are not yes and no decisions or as simple as what you're laying out here. What we're evaluating and looking at is how to keep people on our military bases safe while also getting these U.S. citizens 
dual citizens, people who are prepared to let, leave Afghanistan, uh, able to leave. At the same time, we don't think it ha we we're not going to allow flights that have hundreds of people who we don't know who they are, who haven't been security protocol through security protocols, where we haven't seen the manifest, to land on U.S. military bases. Okay, there are now more terrorists wanted by the FBI and the new Afghan government than there are women. Does the president think that is a foreign policy success? Well, first of all, no one in this administration, not the president nor anyone on the national security team, would suggest that the Taliban are respected and valued members of the global community. They have not earned that in any way, and we are not. We have never assessed that. This is a uh, a caretaker cabinet that does include four former imprisoned Taliban fighters. We have not validated that. We have not conveyed we're going to recognize it. What we are working to do, and nor are we rushing to recognition, there's a lot they have to do before that. What we are working to do is to engage with them because they oversee and control Afghanistan right now to get American citizens, uh, legal permanent residents, uh, as SIV applicants out of Afghanistan. But, we have to engage with but them. To engage with them, their new acting interior minister is a Haqqani network terrorist. He's wanted for a bombing that killed six people, including an American. He's believed to have participated in cross border attacks against. U.S. troops, there's a $10 million bounty on his head. Why are we engaging? Should we government? not Should we not talk to the people who are overseeing Afghanistan and just leave it and not get the rest of the American citizens out? What are you waiting for them to do? They I'm, just formed their government. But are you waiting for something? Uh, uh, some waiting for specific? what? You're, you're saying that uh, we're not going to rush to recognition. That means that there could be recognition. As we've said many times, the international community is watching. The United States is watching. It's whether they let people uh, depart the country who want to depart, whether they treat women across the country as they have committed to treat and them, and how they that. behave and operate. And therefore, we're not moving toward recognition. At the same time, we're dealing with a reality world here where we have to engage in order to get American citizens and others out of the country. Go ahead. Jen, you mentioned that there will be news tomorrow in the president's speech as it relates to mandates. Should Americans expect more similar <coughs> government mandates like what we've seen with agencies and the federal workforce, or would this be in a different category? Well, we've always said we would build on what's been announced to date, right, with the Department of Defense, Veterans Affairs, NIH, and others. And I expect you'll hear more from the president on that tomorrow. We also believe that the private sector has a role here, and you'll hear more from the president on that as well. Will he set any new goals or benchmarks tomorrow, or is that not viewed as a very useful tool anymore, given vaccinations are lower than they were compared to earlier this year when those were what was maybe driving some of that? Well, the president still working through his speech, and our objective and our goal is to vaccinate more people so we can reduce the spread of the virus. But I'd also note, before we compare now to six months ago, six months ago, or when the president came into office, there were about a tiny percentage of people who were vaccinated. Then we had much wider access, thanks to the operational preparations of this administration, to the vaccine. So naturally, we knew that there would be a, uh, an uptick in vaccinations, and then it would be harder and harder, because there were, we would get to the point where people didn't want to get the vaccine who had access to the vaccine. That was a period uh, that we knew and anticipated would happen. What we did see was a promising trend about the numbers in August, which were significantly higher than July. And just lastly, uh, following up on the trip yesterday, yeah. will any more New Jersey counties be added to that disaster declaration? Or is the damage assessment still ongoing? The damage assessment is still ongoing. Uh, it's a process, of course, that has to uh, move through not just county officials, but FEMA to assess the damage. But certainly, we are amenable to that. Uh, and the president has been very clear with every elected official in New Jersey and other states that whatever they need, uh, we will work to get them what they need. But there's, of course, a process that needs to be uh, completed, which is still ongoing. Go ahead. Uh, one follow-up on Texas and abortion and another on sure. reconciliation. Can you say if the White House supports the Women's Health Protection Act? And if not, why not, since this is a bill that would codify Roe v. Wade, which you've said is a priority for the White House? Well, there are many ways to codify Roe v. Wade, um, and, and that is something the President remains committed to. I don't have a new assessment of our support for the piece of legislation. We are still reviewing uh, what our options are. are there reservations about that bill? Uh, we're still looking at whether that's a vehicle we're going to support, but we still support codifying Roe v. Wade. And are there reports that Senator Manchin will only support as much as $1.5 trillion in a reconciliation package? Uh, has the President spoken to Senator Manchin or does he have plans to? And would the White House accept a $1.5 trillion plan? Well, 
first, uh, Senator Manchin, of course, continues to be a very important partner to the President and the President's agenda. And we fully expected uh, that there would be uh, a range of negotiations in private. Sometimes they spill out into the public. Um, and that is what is happening uh, as we speak around components of the package. Uh, but we also uh, know that this is a process that's ongoing, one that we just lived through over the summer, where there were many times where the agenda was called dead, and it turned out it wasn't. Uh, so the, I'm not going to read out any calls or engagements the President has with Senator Manchin. We engage with him on a regular basis from a senior level, including with the President. Uh, and we are uh, looking ahead to getting this bill passed and moving it forward. $1.5 Again, I'm not going to negotiate from here. Uh, what the President is encouraged by is agreement about the need to lower costs for working families, from prescription drugs to child care to the cost of college to elder care, on the need to tackle the climate crisis, and uh, on the need for corporations and the wealthiest Americans to pay their fair share in taxes. I would also note that whatever the size is, it's not actually accurate to call it any of these sizes, one, 1 1.5, 2, 3.5. This is going to be paid for. That is the, something the President uh, is committed to, something Senator Manchin has called for as well. And the real choice right now is whether you're going to lower costs for people in this country on elder care, child care, co cost of college, or whether you're going to uh, prevent or allow uh, the wealthiest Americans and corporations to continue to pay the tax rates that are hardly fair uh, moving forward. I've been told you have to wrap. Okay, go ahead. Uh, in an attempt to clarify uh, the White House's position on the debt limit, uh, yeah. from my friend Justice. Sure. Uh, so, in her letter today, the Secretary said that uh, the extraordinary measures would run out sometime in October. Mm -hmm. Is it the White House's wish that, well, is it the White House's expectation? The Congress will act by the end of September, by September 30th. Well, our expectation and hope is that they act in advance of the money running out, yes. So you expect then that the, the, the line is drawn, that September 30th is the deadline that this White House is setting? Well, I, I would be clear that in the Secretary's letter, she, made, she also conveyed that because of uh, the fact that we don't have all of the information at this point on inflows from taxes that come in mid-September, they didn't give an exact date. But yes, of course, our objective is to raise the debt limit before it becomes uh, a crisis. Yesterday, the president said that uh, he intended to see wildfire damage when he heads west. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any more information you can share on that? He will see wildfire damage. I know we are eager. You're all eager. I'm eager to get it announced, uh, to announce the details of his trip. That will be early next week. Uh, we hope to have those in the next 24 hours. Okay. I think I have to wrap up, but let me do one more. Okay. On yeah. the reconciliation yeah. legislation on health care, does the White House believe President Biden and Democratic lawmakers will ultimately have to make a choice between expanding Medicare benefits and shoring up the Affordable Care Act, particularly to stay under the overall price tag? And if there is a choice, what would President Biden choose? I certainly understand your question. I think you probably can predict what I'm going to convey to you is that there are a range of discussions and negotiations between a broad swath of the Democratic caucus right now, and I'm just not going to negotiate or weigh in from here on this particular question. Quick question. Can the White House confirm that it has asked appointees from the last administration to resign for various boards, including the West Point Advisory Board and the Naval Academy Board, and why? Uh, yes, we have. Uh, and uh, the president's objective is what any president's objective is, is was to ensure you have uh, nominees and people serving on these boards who are qualified to serve on them and who are aligned uh, with your values. Uh, and so, yes, that was a, an ask that was made. Is there any concern that because a lot of these appointees do go across administrations that mm -hmm. there is a risk of politicizing these non-traditionally non-controversial positions? Well, I will let others evaluate whether they think Kellyanne Conway and Sean Spicer and others were qualified or not political uh, to serve on these boards. Uh, but uh, the president's uh, qualification requirements are not your party registration. Uh, they are whether you're qualified to serve and whether uh, you're aligned with the values of this administration. Thanks, everyone. And a follow-up on the story about Dr. Fauci yesterday in the Intercept. The doctor